In this video, we're picking up at the bottom of page 75 in our book after we're coming back from our break, so we're still in chapter 3. And we are looking at a section now uh, that's going to talk about working with some of the tools that are built into the browser. Now, those of you that are taking JavaScript and have learned a little bit about it, you've probably seen these things before. Like, one of the very first things you do is you usually write a little alert statement in JavaScript. You maybe create a script section at the top of your document, and you throw alerts and throw a little message in there, and the box pops up, and you feel all proud of yourself because now you learn how to do a pop-up and annoy people, right? Um, and an alert is one where it simply just puts the message up on the screen and gives you an OK button. There are other forms to this, though, which you guys have, I'm assuming, have learned as well. One is a prompt where it puts, it, puts up the same type of box. It gives you a text box in which you can interact and type in a value or a string or something. And then not only do you get OK, but you also get Cancel. So you get a positive and negative response availability. And then you also get the confirm box. And notice the confirm box, because it's on the right side of an assignment statement, what is that telling you? It's returning something. And it has to be stored somewhere. So one of the only ways you can call a confirm box is by having somewhere to store the result of the confirm. So in other words, it's like, do you want to format your hard drive? OK or cancel, right? It's yes or no. You're not adding any values to it, but you do need somewhere for that to go. All right. Now, there are the functions that you can, uh, that are built in, and you guys have probably used those already, but they're having you think about how those might actually be structured in the background, and that's really what this little piece of code is about because you know what that's exactly how they write the JavaScript core language is they create these functions uh, inside the core they name them they put little return statements in there little functions that they do that's all those things that we call that that seem to be built into the language folks those are all just functions that somebody wrote at some point in time a long time ago and then we just use them like they're just there right but these are things that people created Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, because that in essence would be returning a value to the if statement that would be true or false, and then the if statement would execute as a result. So if the person says, okay, you know, launch the virus. If they say cancel, reformat their hard drive. One or the other. <laughs> Sign them up for some spam lists. I'm thinking like a hacker today, uh, Richard. <laughs> a cynical one on top of it all. Yeah, ethical, that's it. All right, let's talk about uh, variable scope. Um, in JavaScript, you know, as it says here, there are basically two scopes, global and local. For something to be considered a local variable, it does require uh, that you use that, that var uh, keyword. They have this real strong ca caution here when you declare variables like this. And you can do this, and a lot of programmers do it. And I'll say that over and over and over again. And really, in a lot of ways, there's nothing wrong with it, you know, especially if you're doing something simple. But you've got to be careful that you're not stepping on the toes of your other code. Because you might decide to say total cost in a few different spots and then end up shooting yourself in the foot. All right, so they, they tell you that if you don't include that var keyword, it does become a global variable which can cause problems. If you declare within a, within a block of code, then that kind of mitigates that problem. All right. So let's take a look at these next examples coming up. And some of these, I will tell you right off the bat, at, at some point, they get kind of deep, and it's kind of easy to lose your way. You guys aren't worrying about taking a pro-level cert, right, at this point in your careers? Uh, if you were, then you would study this backwards and forwards. If not, let it absorb as much as it does, and then move on. Don't, don't freak out to it. I'm not going to really quiz you on this kind of stuff on a test. Remember, we have no tests in this class. Yay! Right? We're, we're about doing it rather than 
thinking about doing it. But what they're indicating here that it is possible to actually write a function inside of a function. Now that's not something we normally think about doing because what you've learned as programmers so far is you're writing a program and then I have like three, four, five functions or methods and I call them as I need them. You don't think about taking one and putting it inside of another one. But what that does is it isolates it so it's only available to that particular one. So if you look here, we have a function inside of a function. One is called area of a pizza. And where is that returning it to? Hmm. Where is that returning it to? Yeah, it's returning it to here, which is doing what? Yeah, it's doing a little bit of math and then returning the whole thing. So area of a pizza is only available to area of pizza slice, right? This next little section is kind of interesting because here we are actually changing data types. So let's look, let's look at the code. I think it's the best thing to do rather than read all that text. So we have a variable age equals prompt, enter age, and then empty quote. So what does that do? Puts up a prompt box that's got a text field, and hypothetically, you would type in what? Your age, right? Your name, no. What's your favorite color? Bad joke. <laughs> okay, my All right, and then you get an alert box. But notice what they're doing here is just in case the user types in a value. Hold on a second. So what this is really telling us, if you read this carefully, is when I get that prompt box and I type in, you know, 29, right, Richard? Yeah. Yeah, 29, <laughs> forever, right? That is actually being captured as what? A string, which is not a number. So we use the number function, that's why you see me highlighting it there, that converts it to a number so then we can actually do the math. <laughs> you know what, Jason? In, in many cases, it would just do the math. But it's considered proper approach to force it to a number. Now, of course, you could try it and then prove me right or wrong. But they do have that uh, in there. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Oh, that's just an empty placeholder for uh, the, the text box and the prompt box. That's, so when you're going to be sending that, that value, you're, you're not, this is the message that appears on the box, and then this would be what pre-appears in the text field. So you could actually put something like, enter your name here, there, before they, you know. So you could put a value here and then leave like the Correct. Right. right. Zero. 29. All right. Um, conversely, we also have a function that takes things like numbers and converts them to strings. So for example, here, x and y are clearly numbers. But if we want to, uh, you know, get to display inside of an alert box, technically, we should convert it to a string first so that it displays as a string. Because whenever we do display or whenever we capture data, it's always as a string. Okay, very simple examples, but important nonetheless. All right now, we're moving on to conditional programming. Conditional programming that that's also the equivalent of the selection statements that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and the most basic form of it utilizes um, the if uh, keyword. And you guys, I assume, have used that before, right? If, else, and that's a real common language construct. Uh, in fact, most languages will treat it almost the exact same way. Now, they are putting up a little scenario here that I'm going to have us kind of logic through. And if there's anything that I hope that you glean, at least from tonight's lecture, is to start to get yourselves into the mindset where you guys can start to look at code and start to read it and try to figure out what it does without actually programming it. 
so that when you're faced with new code in any language, you can find some sort of a, a base for being able to look at it and figure it out. You guys are at the point where you've learned a few languages now, and you should be able, without a lot of effort, to pick up another language pretty quickly. Right? Math operators are usually the same. Logical operators are similar. You know, if statements are the same. You know, so it's very easy to pick stuff up and to move really quick and learn a lot of languages in a short period of time. Of course, you never really be a master unless you do actual work in that language. Uh, but it depends on what you do as a career. So, all right, let's look at this code. It says var age prompt enter age. So we get a box. Type in your age. Richard, this looks like the, the question you had before. Could we put the return of a function inside of an if statement? Absolutely. In fact, that's a real common usage. So there's a built-in method in JavaScript, or function in JavaScript more appropriately, that's called isNAN, which is what? Is this not a number? If it's true, okay, so it is not a number, meaning it is text, right? Logic, right? You need to enter a valid number. So it's realizing that it's text. Else, obviously it is and it's working. All right, so that's a real common thing to do um, in a programming language. Now, notice as they start to ramp up the examples here, now we have two statements inside of each part of the if statement. So two statements in the if, two statements in the else. What did they add? What's different between this code and this code? They try to make it bold, but it doesn't really stand out so much. It's the curly brackets, folks. Notice up here, there's only one statement inside the if. There's no curly brackets. There's only one statement inside the else, no curly brackets. Fascinating, right? Should be fascinating. My advice, and I say this in every language that allows for that convention, is don't ever do it that way. Always put curly brackets in, even if it's one statement, because it, it it's, makes your brain think cl more clearly about what you're doing. And there will be times where you have if statements inside of if statements inside of else ifs, and it gets really watered down. And if you're not using your curly brackets, you don't know what's like evaluating with what, and it can really be a problem. All right. Speaking of, of else ifs, similar to the if else, but the else if allows for every time you declare else if, and notice that in this language, the else and the if are not squeezed together. There's a space in between them you are testing another value or another Boolean statement before you run that piece of code. So you can do if, else, if, else, if, else. That would be an example. Now when you start to do a whole bunch of else ifs, that's when you start considering switching to a different format of selection. And you guys have probably seen these statements before too. Some languages will call them slightly different things, but basically a switch or a case statement. And the way that this works is very similar to the else if, because really what it's doing is it's receiving a value, and it's saying, well, if that value is this, then do that. But notice with the case statements that each one of them at the end has a what? A break, meaning stop evaluating the switch statement and get out. Right. Because what will happen if you don't have that in there depending on the values you're passing and how your statements are structured, you could hypothetically trigger multiple pieces of code. In fact, if you didn't have the break statement in case red, it would also trigger the alert in default. So well, how does default work? Right. If none of the other things trigger, default will, will go. Does default have to be there? No. That's not obligatory. Now, when I, you know, switch from a structure like this, else ifs, to a switch, is when I start to get a list, you know, usually in my mind, anything like a, if I get past like four or five else ifs, 
then I'm thinking about switch right away. The only reason I, I might not do a switch is if the if statements are complicated. And that way, then I'll usually stick with an if. But that's just my convention. You'll find one that works for you. Where you see switch being very useful is like, for example, if you're doing a form and you have a drop down for the states, right? Like, what state are you from? And there's a list of 50, or, or throw some territories in, or some provinces, whatever. And you get a longer list. Those lend themselves really well, switch statements to processing things like that. In fact, if you're enterprising, you can just go out to the web and find somebody that's already pre-built it for you, so you don't have to code it all by hand. Right? Who wants to sit there and code switch case, you know, W I switch case I L switch case. Oh heck, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do this 50 times. You know, somebody else has done it. Save the time, find the code, copy it, and, and just use it. No, it's not cheating. It's how everybody works on the way. Yeah. Well, well the, the, the listing of the things in the drop down box would be HTML, would be HTML form entries. But the processing in JavaScript, yeah. Because so what happens if I pick Wisconsin, right? I mean, and how does that matter in my code? Maybe it's just text, or maybe if I switch to Illinois, you know, then all of a sudden we can charge more taxes, right? Which is how it works. <laughs> and not receive anything for it. That's a bad joke. Right. Yes, you can do a conditional statements uh, inside of case statements, so you can do that. I, and I just told you that my preference is I usually don't do it that way. I usually will use ifs, but that's just me, okay? Um, notice that you can use pre-built methods like is not a number, um, or you can run Boolean statements, and you can get really complicated ones in there if you want and if you get the logic right. So just be careful how you structure those. No, I'm not gonna walk through that example. I think you guys are bright enough to figure it out. All right. Another thing that you might see, uh, and you maybe have seen already, usually when we run an if statement, we're, we're always thinking about comparisons, right? Is this greater than that? Or if this equals that, then let's run it. Or this equals that, and this equals that, and then we'll do it, right? But we have uh, the capability also to just to see if something has a value. So the example here would indicate that if this variable called my var has a value, Right? In other words, its value is not null, then go ahead and execute the code. If it doesn't, give me the else. Right? So why would that be useful? Well, let's say you're grabbing data from a form or something, and the person forgot to fill out the credit card number. Well, I'm not going to process the credit card without the credit card. Right? And in fact, then you might like change the CSS on the page, or pop up a message, or do something else that's equally annoying and attention getting, <laughs> right? Well, how would you know it has a value is because this would tell you it has a value. You, you coded it in. If it didn't, the, the other piece of code would trigger. You want to see the non-value? You can display it to the screen. Yeah, if it has a value. So in other words, if I declared a variable and didn't assign it a value, this would trigger false. So if I just said var, my var, semicolon, I didn't assign anything to it, that would trigger false. If I say var, my var equals five, or house, or something like that, then it would trigger true. It doesn't care what the value is, just that it has one or doesn't. Yep. Yeah. If it doesn't exist, it's false. If it exists, it's true. Does that help? Well, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I just didn't know that 
Yeah, and, and this is usually an approach that you don't see novice programmers using, right? This is usually more, more of a seasoned approach because they just don't know that, that it's possible. But here you guys are, you can use that approach. You have my permission <laughs> to do something advanced. All right. All right. <clears throat> so notice that uh, they, they're doing a little, uh, little trick here. It says, often you want to check a variable to see whether it has a value. And if a variable has a value, use it uh, or the default value. So JavaScript has this real simple little way of doing it. So for example, if you have a value for value customer or for customer, then you would not get the valued customer in the second piece. Does that make sense? Because the first one would trigger true if the person entered your name. But if they just said okay and not type something in, then it would just say valued customer, right? It's kind of like when I ordered pizza today, I chose not to sign into Pizza Hut. <laughs> I continued as a guest. <laughs> so that's not really a good example, but that's what was in my head because I just ate pizza. So. You can also take it a step further. And remember, these are ORs, folks. The same type of approach. So if these values don't get set, it'll just say valued customer. If, one of, if a customer name is set or a company name is set, it'll just work. We're moving on. All right. Now let's talk about that equal, equal, and triple equal. Or equal, equal, equal. All right. So these, these are pretty important to know. Uh, and if you were serious about doing a certification, you definitely want to pay attention to this because there's a couple points in the cert where they try to trick you with it. If you have like a pretty inane looking statement, you try to find what's wrong with it and you don't, if your head doesn't you know, trigger necessarily. So with a double equal sign, notice that null is the same as undefined. Hmm. Null really is a variable that has no value. Undefined actually is something that isn't even a variable. See the difference? Now, with the equal equal, they're okay. They're the same. Well, neither one has a value, right? Okay, so they're the same. That's the thinking. But notice down below, that would be false. Because not only do they have to be nothing, but they have to be exactly the same. And that's, that's the thing with the triple equal. Uh, false, equal equals zero, that's true. And in some cases, you see people still that will stick with ones and zeros for doing true, true and false, when really you should be using true and false, the keywords. So uh, false, triple equals false, that would be true. Same thing with an empty string equals zero above, equal, equal. Well, one's nothing, the other's nothing. Sure, that's about the same. Truth is, they're not the same. Because one's an empty string and one's zero, which is a number, right? They're not really the same thing at all. I mean, zero represents nothing, but it really is still something. And it's something different than an empty string. Same with the one, two, three. That one's just text. A number and that one's really interesting because here's like a way that you can take text input and check to see if the string equals a number that's okay right with the equal equal triple equal would deny that as being true because it's not the same data type that's really a rule that holds in most languages as well folks so please keep that in mind I'm not going to go real deep on, on this loop part, but I can tell you we're getting close to the end of the important data structures here. At least that's my sense. But looping leads us to that third of the programming paradigms, which is repetition, and uh, the third tool for solving logical problems. One of the most common forms of loops are what we call a while loop. The thing that you learn with while loops all of you have encountered loops before, right? If they're not, not a foreign concept? Okay, good. Whew. All right. With a while loop, you will use the keyword while, 
set of curly brackets. You usually will have some sort of a logical test like you do in an if statement, whether it's true or false, to see if the loop will run. The catch with the while loop is, in order for the loop to trigger at all, you have to preset prior to the loop a loop control variable that will trigger it true to run. So that's why you see the x above the while set to 10, which the programmer knew is greater than 0, and therefore will get the loop to run. Catch with the loop, though, is that loop control variable, it'll just keep running, right? The statements will just keep running. If you don't have some way to change the value of that loop control variable, or the sentinel value, we call it in some languages, you can get stuck there forever, and that becomes what? An infinite loop. So this little operator here will decrease x by 1 each time. So you guys are learning right away that JavaScript also has the plus plus and the minus minus, both prefix and postfix. And you guys should be familiar with those, I hope. So that's the catch with the while loop. Preset the, the variable before the loop starts. Change that variable somehow inside that loop so you're not stuck there forever. While loops. While loops work well in lots of situations. Now they also have what they call a post-test loop, okay? Which is basically a while loop, but the condition is checked when? At the end, right? So what this is doing, unlike the while loop, the while loop needs that variable to be set above so it runs at least once. With a do loop, or a post-test loop, depending on how you call it, the loop will run at least once before the condition check. So it will actually run this statement and run that statement, and then it will check to see if the condition is true to run it again. If it's false, it moves on. If it's true, it loops again. Now you still can get into a, an infinite loop here, right? So you still need a way to change the things that are checked in the condition. But what you're seeing here, logic-wise, is a real common approach using a post-test loop to see if somebody is logged into a system, right? How many retries are you going to give them? Three, right? So you give them three tries to log in, and that's all they get. They start with the counter at zero, then they go in, they try to log in, that's the first try, right? If they authenticate, great. If not, do it again, do it again, do it again, right? You've done it three times, too bad. Call the admin to get your password reset or click the forgot my password thing, whatever your thing is. All right. Then we have what we call the for loop. And the for loop, what I've seen with, you know, over my, my years is doing this, is people that tend to have a fondness for loops <laughs> tend to prefer the for loop for a lot of different reasons because it, it in some ways is a little bit more powerful, especially if you already know up front how many times you need to run the loop, which often is the case. So they have the, the generic form here, but I'm just going to jump down to the example. The one thing that differentiates this is that variable that you might set prior to the loop running is set right within the statement. So the first position is the loop control variable being initialized or set. Then you actually have the condition that you're checking, and then the increment, decrement, or altering of that loop control variable that will control the loop running or stopping or whatever. So that allows for more efficient code. So we can do often less code, less lines of code, and accomplish the same tasks using a for loop, and that's why a lot of programmers prefer it. It is possible to break out of a loop in a different way, and this is one approach where some people will put if statements in, and you can use that break keyword to jump out of the structure. So you can put an if statement inside there, a little conditional. The condition hits. You can hit 
You throw in a break statement, pop them out, and you're done. So that is one way you can jump out. All right, in this next section, we are definitely wading into what I would call deeper waters. Um, in terms of like your JavaScript learning, this is probably not something that you learn in, in rudimentary JavaScript. But it is something that you learn in higher level programming, usually like at the end of a level one course or into like a level two or three course, and this concept of what we call exception handling. All right, and notice an exception, it says, is an error that occurs at runtime due to an illegal operation during execution. If you have an exception in a program that is compiled, so if I was like building a Java program and I had a screen that says, please enter your age, right? So you type in a number and you press enter. Except I'm an idiot and I typed, I missed the keyboard and instead of typing uh, 29, I typed W-O, right? Because that's right by there. Those are letters. The program wants numbers, right? And I didn't set up the variable that's receiving the input to take letters. So what happens to the program? It crashes, right? It just stops execution because you just broke it. You gave it the wrong thing. It doesn't know what to do with it, right? So that would be considered an exception, a runtime exception that you're putting in something that's breaking the code as it's running. So what you do is you set up what they call an exception. And an exception works in kind of a clever way with the whole intent of it being to keep your code running and not break the user experience. You don't want, like if somebody's dumb and doesn't know how to type in a number when you're asking for it, it doesn't mean like you should halt the program and lock up the computer and make the person reboot, right? That's not, <laughs> that's, like, yeah, that's a little, yes, you might think, yeah, from, from a comedy standpoint, absolutely. All right, so what they, what they came up with was this approach called exception handling, right? And the way exception handling works is we set up what we call try-catch blocks. And if you want to think of a correlation, you might think of like if-else almost. Kind of like that, but not exactly. So in a try situation, what we do is in between the curly brackets of the try, we will put in code that we want to be the main code, right? And if it works, it works. Great. We move on. However, guy's an idiot. He typed in letters where he should have typed in numbers. Then we throw in the catch. So the catch will catch the exception, will catch the mistake, and then run a piece of code relative to the mistake. In some cases, what a lot of programmers will do is they'll actually take the error message, that's what the X message is, and show it to the user. Like, you know, uh, that's not a number, it's undefined, or, you know, some gobbledygook from the, the, the internal engine of the browser, which I don't always think is helpful. It might just be better to say, uh, dude, you typed letters and we wanted numbers. Can you please put some numbers in? And then what you would do is you would pop them back up and have them try again, right? Um, and then uh, the other part of a try-catch situation is we also have this thing which is kind of the equivalent of the default in the switch statement called finally which we can force to execute whether it was successful or not right now do you always need to finally most of the times you don't usually try catch is adequate but there are situations that regardless of whether someone succeeds or not that you have something else that happens so that's just a scenario now I know that the author probably will give you many different uh, things about that. And I would all, also encourage you guys, if you guys want to have some fun, answer these questions. Here's the answers if you care. All right, now we're moving on to lesson number two. And in this section, we are uh, going to be focusing on a really important programming concept called test-driven development. And you can see the acronym is TDD. Test-driven development, in a nutshell, is a way for you to be able to write code to test the code that you've written before you deploy it to the user. Right? So you write code to test code. And then if you can get your code to pass the test, then you're ready to deploy it. Sounds kind of silly, but it is a very common practice. In fact, it's a very in-demand skill out in the workplace. And if you look around, you will find jobs out there where they look for people that have done test-driven development. 
fact, they'll look for people who just even know what it means. <laughs> because they're, they're that kind of in demand. So usually that'll be for more complicated um, types of code. But no, Agile, Agile is, a, is a development methodology. It has, it, well, test-driven development can certainly be incorporated into Agile development, but Agile really refers to a development technique. All right, so one of the tools that we're going to be using inside of Visual Studio is this tool called QUnit, and it is designed to run test-driven development tools in using JavaScript to test JavaScript. Okay, so basically what it is is a collection of JavaScript libraries and functions that we will call upon that will simulate user interaction. In other words, instead of like having a user fill out a form and press submit, we're going to have code simulate the process to see if it works or not. The pattern in the book, and I, I know I've mentioned this before, is that first they'll give you the version that doesn't work, it'll fail, you get screens with red on it, and then they'll give you the versions that do work, and it's green, and then you're happy, right? But don't freak out the first time you get that red screen thinking you did something wrong because that you're doing exactly right, probably. All right. One of the ways that we add um, tools like QUnit is through this thing within Visual Studio called the, the NuGet Package Manager. That tool allows us to add a lot of different plugins to Visual Studio depending on the kind of work we're doing. And you do it dynamically. So for example, if I wanted to add jQuery to a project, right, that's a JavaScript library, I can go to my NuGet pa package manager, search for it, find it, click install, and then all it does is it downloads all the jQuery libraries, and puts them into a folder, and they're ready for use. So instead of me going to the jQuery website, finding the download, getting the version I want, you know, unzipping it, putting it into the project manually, it's all built into the product. So the, the QUnit testing software is one of those packages that you can just enable just like that. All right, so part of the examples that you're seeing here, like here, in this section, fortunately, will go quick as a result, is you'll come in here, you'll look for uh, particular tools in certain spots. Sometimes we'll use the search window to find them. And then once you find what you want, you click install and it drops right into your project. All right, now here they have a bunch of code. I'm not here to read you the code. And as we've discovered, right, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to mention names, Cindy Lou, but um, <laughs> this, I, I see this all the time. People will try to take the code that's in the, in the chapter here and try to run it. And then what we discover is it really is not fully formed code. So don't try to run the code that's in, in the chapter here, especially in this section, because it's not going to work for you. Okay? The tools are different. The code's different. But what will happen is we will start to add the QUnit libraries to our project, just like this. And then we will start to drop in IDs for certain components. And then we will start to utilize the tools that are built in and then if we run a successful test, you'll see a screen that looks like this. It's green, everything passed, there's no warnings or errors or anything like that, it's all good. That's, and that's what we, ideally we want. It means what we intended to happen, happened, this is ready for deployment. All right. In a bad scenario, and I'm assuming they're going to show us this next, right? You're going to get something that looks like that where it'll highlight in red, it'll tell you that something passed, something failed, then it'll tell you what failed, how it failed, why it failed, it'll tell you the lines, okay, it looks like in test.js, line two, uh, column five, that's where the problem starts, and it'll like very specifically get in there and identify what the issue is. Now, here's a really important thing to know about these tests. You can write JavaScript code that is well formed and syntactically correct and even logically correct for the most part that still will fail a test because when, so when you start to simulate what the user will do with the application by giving it certain types of data you might not have considered the type of data they're sending at you 
right? So you really didn't code logically correct. So you can have code that is well formed that still doesn't work. That's one of the reasons why they do this type of testing is to make sure that it operates under all scenarios. Why it's an important skill. All right. I'm not really going to say too much more about this. Uh, there is also the QUnit Metro, which they talk about and you guys will play with. And that's in the exercises. You see how fast that's going? All right. Now let's go finally to the script tag and talk about how to actually add this JavaScript to an HTML file. The one way that you can do it is by using the script tag. The script tag can be placed either in the head section of the document or in the body in line with the HTML. It does not matter. And then once you get past the script tag, then you can just, inside of it, put your straight up JavaScript. It doesn't matter if it's in the head or the body. Do you guys notice the two little highlights that I have there? And this is something that my, thank my lucky stars is finally like gotten to the point where it's gone away. But in the old days, before we had real standardized versions of HTML, we could not always be certain that users had JavaScript turned on or which version of HTML they were running. So what we'd get is if JavaScript was turned off, we would have to go in and we would have to put comment marks in around our JavaScript code to make sure it didn't render as HTML just in case. We would have to do that with all our scripts. Cumbersome. In HTML5, in the modern browsers we have now, you can kind of summarily dismiss that. So your only consideration for that would be legacy applications for legacy browsers. And at this point, we're probably looking at Internet Explorer 7 and earlier, which is very unlikely that you'll even encounter it. But that's important to know. Um, so really, those two pieces, for the most part, I'd say you can exclude from your code. But interesting, in the past, when we first started using JavaScript, oh my gosh, that was a, like a hardcore requirement that we, that we did that. Now, folks, we are getting now to this uh, section here where we're going to talk about some real high-end JavaScript stuff, and I'm actually going to stop the lecturing right here at this point is this we're going to talk about this part next week yes the team that's going to go another week that's why the due date is so stretched out um, because now we're getting really getting into the deep end of the pool your feet are not touching the bottom anymore like eight feet nine feet right All right but these are some really important concepts and a little bit of preview that i'm going to give you is that we have the uh, ability here, if you read the two lines that I highlighted, to actually operate portions of JavaScript code either synchronously, asynchronously, or with deferred runtime. So in other words, you can execute a script and make it wait until something else happens, or make it run while something else is running, all with certain types of strategy involved, right? What determines that strategy depends on your programming situation. And the book does a nice job of explaining what those things are, and when we get into subsequent chapters, they get even deeper into it. Because one thing that happens when we program with JavaScript, and you guys may have experienced this when you go to a website, if you go to a website that loads a lot of JavaScript, sometimes it takes a long time for a page to load. Why? Is it because they have too many images? Not necessarily. Sometimes it's because they're loading so much JavaScript like tens of thousands of lines of JavaScript before the page can do anything. One of the reasons we have these tools is to allow us to, for example, load the page and make it responsive while in the background we're still loading up the JavaScript. Okay, um, These are things that were not possible prior to HTML5. These are things that were added and really kind of make you know, JavaScript and HTML5 a lot more powerful. All right, folks, so the lecture ends here for tonight. <laughs>